simply sing a couple of hymns, we would spend a good deal of time in the Word of God, and then we would visit with one another and uh, enjoy one another's fellowship. A big part of the family of God is the fellowship that we have with each other, and so that's good, and I love seeing you talking with one another as you do both before and after our time together. Now, we're here, we are we're studying through the book of Revelation. And it is divided into 22 chapters. Chapter and verse divisions, as you probably know, were not part of the original, original manuscripts of, of any of the books of the Bible. And there is nothing particularly significant about the chapter and verse divisions other than they help us to study the book, the Bible, in smaller pieces and they help us to find passages quickly and easily. And so, uh, for the most part, as we go through the book of Revelation, I've been taking it chapter by chapter. I think there was one time when we combined two chapters, but other than that, it looks like we'll be doing a chapter at a time. We've seen a lot so far in this journey through the book of Revelation. Keep in mind that John was writing down what he was seeing in this truly, truly remarkable vision from the Lord. Now, John may not have realized it at the time, but he was writing the last book of the Bible. And God was revealing to him, and not only to him, but to the church, what was to take place at the end of the age. Obviously, God felt it was crucial that the church, that is his people, that, you know, that's what the church is, right? The church of Christ, the church of God, is the people of God, those who know the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. They are the church. And so God felt it important that his people know something about the last day. I believe God did not want Christians, particularly Christians alive in the last days, to be ignorant of what would happen in that time. He did not want his people to be caught off guard. He did not want them to be deceived. Jesus says that there will be incredible amounts of deception in those last days. So God didn't want us to be deceived, but rather the Lord wanted to equip his people so that they could and would endure in the faith no matter how tough things would become. And the scripture clearly shows us that it will become very tough for believers in the last days. But God was also re revealing <laughs> in the book of Revelation his great power and his glory and his majesty so that Christians would not become fearful, or think that God had forgotten them, or think that sin and wickedness would win out in the end. Revelation shows us that God wins. That's one of the great things about the book. It shows the glory, the power, the absolute authority of God, and that all things are under his control, and he will win. Now, there are incredulous things taking place in the book, uh, some of which we've already seen. We'll see some more unfolded in today's chapters and in the coming chapters. But what God wants us to do is to remain confident that he is completely in control. So keep that as a backdrop in your own mind as we study, continue to study through the book. God is in control. None of these things will happen as a surprise to him. He allows many things to take place. He will cause some things to take place. In the end, he will bring justice for all mankind. He will judge the wicked, and he will save the righteous, that is, those who have placed their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, let's get into chapter 12. You notice I haven't gone through a, a, a review of all the chapters, as I've done many times. 
up to this point, but we're going to continue now into chapter 12. There's a lot for us to consider. The first verse. And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Now, if we didn't know other parts of the scriptures, that might be a little bit hard to interpret. We say, well, what in the world is John seeing here? But we, we know what's being shown us because of other parts of the word of God. This is a picture of the people of Israel, chosen and protected by God in the most remarkable ways so that they endure to this day in spite of all odds. How do we know Israel is depicted? Well, the people of Israel were made up of 12 tribes, the sons of Jacob. If you remember, and we've talked about this in our Genesis study on Tuesday nights, God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob that he would bless them and multiply them, and <coughs> most importantly, that through them, God would bless all nations. <laughs> and against all odds, he would make them into a great nation through which would come the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ. This is what this verse reflects. Now we go on to verse 2. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. This is a very brief picture of the birth of the Messiah. Israel, through the power and promises of God, birthed the Messiah. God isn't giving details here of Jesus' birth or even which tribe of Israel the Messiah would come from. All of those details are in other places in the New Testament. This is only the big picture of what had happened and then what will happen. Israel brought forth the promised Messiah, but he would be opposed, and more specifically, he would be opposed by Satan himself. Ever since the Garden of Eden, Satan has tried in every way to subvert God's plan. And that subversion would continue until the very end, as we will now see in these next verses. Let's go to look, look at verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his seven heads seven diadems. It sounds like some sort of modern movie of these kinds of things. But John was seeing this. And remember, the images he is, uh, he is seeing are reflective or are symbolic of realities, of things that will actually take place. So the great red dragon is symbolic of Satan, the prince of demons, the hater of God the evil one who seeks to destroy the plan of God to save the world through his son, Jesus, the Redeemer. We will see more about the seven heads and ten horns in later chapters, but for now, just know that a great ruler will arise in the last days who will have the support of a number of nations and world leaders. We don't have to say more about that now because we'll eventually get to that. And as we will see in the next chapter, the great, the, or the power of this great ruler will come from Satan himself. It's a fascinating study. And God is very clear about these things. Even though he's using symbolic images, he's very clear. This great ruler who comes to power in the last days in other places, the Bible calls him the Antichrist. In the next chapter, he will be called the Beast. Um, his power will come from Satan. He will be possessed by Satan. And he will oppose God and seek to set himself up as God. He will also demand that all people worship him as God. And those who don't comply will be refused access to purchase or to sell anything. 
The next chapter identifies this person, as, as I said, the beast, and we will see in greater detail what he will be like and the kind of power he has. Today's chapter is setting the stage for that to take place. So we go to verse 4. This dragon then, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. And again, if we haven't had the opportunity to study Revelation thoroughly and all the parts of the scriptures that kind of fill this all in, maybe this explanation will help. Again, Satan is, de is depicted as a great dragon who, when he rebelled against God, took a third of the angels with him. The scriptures show us that. A third of the heavenly host joined in his rebellion. And though Satan, or Lucifer, was merely an angel created by God, he wanted to usurp God's place and God's authority. And so he was cast out. This is still the essence of rebellion to this day. It is the idea that I don't need God. I don't have to obey him. I am the master of my own fate. I can do what I please. Much of the world is living like that today in rebellion against God. Even though it may not seem outwardly so in some cases, if they are refusing to submit to the word of God, to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his authority, to his reign in our lives, they are in rebellion against God, even as Satan is in rebellion against him. By the way, this is how Satan deceived Adam and Eve in the garden. You know, remember his, he came to Adam and Eve, did God really tell you that? Did God really say that? Satan loves to sow seeds of doubt about the clear instructions God gives. And in that case, the instructions that God had given to Adam and Eve. And then he urged them to take a different path than what the Lord said. A path that he said would make them essentially equal with God. It sounded so enticing, but it was a terrible lie. And Satan continues to spread that lie to this very day. You don't need God. In some cases, he wants them to believe that you, you are essentially God. Live any way you want. Do anything you want. Be free. Satan hates his creator. And he and the powers of darkness are fully engaged in every effort to destroy the plans of God, and especially God's plan to bring a redeemer into the world to save mankind from sin. And that's what we see in the next verse. Verse 5, she, that is Israel, gave birth to a male child, that's the Lord Jesus, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So verse, this, verse 5 describes the birth of Jesus, who upon his return will rule nations will abs with absolute authority and perfect justice. Notice here that all of Jesus' life and ministry are placed into a single sentence. Even though the two comings of Christ are separated by more than 2,000 years. It says, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So when Jesus' ministry of redemption was concluded on earth, he ascended into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God until his return to the earth. So now it's important for us to understand that time for God is not the same as it is for us because you see in that, in, in that prophecy a word about the birth of Christ and then his ascension to heaven. And in all the contexts, it's going to be talking about his return. 
God, as you know, has no beginning and no ending. He is not restricted to time. He created time for us and for our benefit, but he is not limited by time. For example, the Bible tells us that for God, a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. So we should know that a prophecy in the Bible might include events that could happen very soon after the prophecy was given, while other events in the same prophecy could take place centuries later. We see that again and again throughout prophecy. Because remember, for God, time is not the same as it is for us. And that's what is happening here. After Jesus' ascension, there has been now at least 2,000 years between that event and what is happening in the next verse. So look at verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Remember, we said that one of the goals of the last world leader will be to destroy any remnants of the Jewish nation and of the Jewish people. I have told you about past attempts to do that very thing. One of those is recorded in the book of Esther in the Old Testament. The other is in modern history when Hitler's Third Reich sought to eradicate the Jews. Verse 6 now speaks of the final attempt to eradicate the Jews. That is still in the future. But remember, chapter 6, back in chapter 6, showed us that God would preserve a remnant of godly Jews who the great final leader, the Antichrist, would not be able to destroy. So we're dealing a little bit now with that here. Verse 6 of our text today says that the woman, that is the remnant of Israel, the 144,000 godly Jews who we looked at in a previous chapter, fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished, that is, taken care of and protected for a period of 1,260 days. We explained that last year, I mean last week. Uh, 1,260 days is the same as three and a half years. When you understand that the Jewish year does not consist of 365 days, but 360 days. So there will be divine protection for this remnant of the Jews at the end of, 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 of in, these, in these last days. But let's look next at what God is showing regarding Satan and his demons and what he reveals is pretty amazing. <laughs> now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. Verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. How can we understand this? Well, I think we can. It is not often in scripture when we are given a glimpse of the things that take place in the heavenlies. At least not these kinds of things. I can think of one other place, and that is in Daniel chapter 10, where we see something similar to this. But here we are told that a war takes place. It's a spiritual warfare that is taking place in the heavenlies with the archangel Michael fighting against Satan and his angels. And Michael, we know from Daniel chapter 10, is the powerful archangel that God has assigned to protect 
the Jewish nation. Verse 8 of our text says that the dragon and his angels are defeated. Satan's angels are fallen angels. Those who rebelled with God, against God, along with Lucifer or Satan. They are the demonic spirits who God has not confined to the pit, to the pit or the abyss. And I won't explain that again because we talked about that several chapters ago. So when the devil and his angels lose the battle in the heavenlies, you know, we won't see that. That is the, those are spirit beings that takes place in the heavenlies. But when that happens, they are thrown out of heaven and down to the earth. Now let me explain a little bit here. Heaven doesn't mean, in this case, doesn't mean the, the, the place where the throne of God is, where God will. Heaven, as it is used sometimes in the scripture, means um, the, 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 uh, uh, the out, outer space. In fact, in the scriptures, there are three heavenlies. There is the first heaven, which is our own atmosphere. There is the second, which is the outer atmosphere, when we think of outer space. And then there's the third heaven, where, where, where God dwells in, in his realm. In, in the heaven that we would use with the, with the capital H. And so we find here that up until this time, the, the, the demonic world has been allowed to roam the heavenlies. But when it reaches this particular point, when there is this great battle, he, Satan, and all of his demonic forces are cast down to the earth. They are now confined to the earth. This is astonishing. And it helps us to realize how this will become such an incredibly destructive place in the very last days. The demonic spirits are confined to this space of the planet earth. And they will be active, and so will be Satan, and so will Satan, as we will see very shortly. So we go down to verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God. I wonder if you are aware of the fact that Satan, God's enemy and our enemy, accuses us before the Father. We can go back into the book of Job in the Old Testament and we see the evidence of that. Satan apparently has access to God and he accuses the redeemed. Of all of our, uh, I, I can imagine it in this way. He might stand before God and he says to God, hey, look at Forrest down there. Look at what he did. Look at what he thought in his mind. And he's no follower of yours, but we are because we have been redeemed. Our sins have been forgiven. We are righteous in the eyes of God, not through any effort or work of our own but by the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who saved us, whose blood for, uh, was shed in order that our sins might be forgiven. So at this point, however, that ceases. At that time, that ceases, and he is cast down to heaven. He is localized. Satan and his demonic force, who's never been localized before, will finally be localized in those very last days days. And Satan will double his efforts, triple them, whatever, in order to destroy anything left of God's plan. But know this, that we stand victorious in Jesus Christ. Completely so. We are the redeemed. Now look at verse 11. And they have conquered him. So verse 10 shows that the, that, that the heavens can rejoice um, there's, the, you know, now the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of Christ have have come. So these things now are going to draw to a conclusion. There's going to be a culmination. 
Satan has been cast down. Verse 11. And they have conquered them. That's still talking about us and those of the last days. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even to death. I think this is in particular talking about the believers in the last days. In the last days, as we have indicated, as the scriptures tell us, the world will become incredibly evil, more so than we see now. Our world will descend into complete depravity spurred on by hatred for God and hatred for all who place their trust in Jesus. Now remember, Jesus said this would take place. He said those who kill Christians will think they are doing God a favor. They will be so far removed from truth they will think that the best way to solve the world's problems is to get rid of us. Christians will be the enemies of the state. And it will be very pronounced and very real. And Satan and his demonic forces will now be present, as you saw from the previous verses, to urge on that depravity and that hatred for Christ and his people. Verse 12, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. So in other words, God's people, no matter what happens to them physically on earth, whether they live out their days in peace, or whether they suffer persecution, or even die for their faith, they are conquerors. They have overcome. They win. They will be with God forever and ever. They will never encounter anything again that is hurtful or that is sinful or that is horrible. And so this voice from heaven says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. That will be, you know, us. We will dwell in heaven, and all of these things one day will be past. And this is why all through the book of Revelation, and really all through the New Testament, God keeps urging us to remain steadfast in the faith. Any afflictions we may encounter here on earth will be nothing compared to to all the good that God has prepared for us in heaven. Now let's move to verses 13 and 14. Actually, the rest of verse 12 also. But it says, Woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, which we just read about, because he knows that his time is short. Verse 13. And the dragon, when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpents into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and a half time. That's, again, three and a half years. So what is about now to take place on earth is, is, is almost unbelievable had God not shown it to us in this revelation that John is recording. What's taking place here is that having been cast out of the heavenlies and now confined to the earth, Satan in great rage seeks to destroy whatever he can of what is left of God's plan. And he will use his demonic powers to that end. We'll see that next chapter. Remember that I said that half, at the halfway point of the seven-year pact with Israel, the Antichrist will reveal his true intentions up to that point to achieve his desired results. He will have presented himself as Israel's savior. I think it's possible he will also, he, he might actually present himself as the Messiah, 
as the returned Christ. That's how tough and great the deception will be. And though cruel and ruthless, he will pass himself, himself off as what a desperate world needs. And he will be accepted by the world at large as the answer to the world's problems. But then suddenly, at the three and a half year point, and the scripture shows us this, he will turn on Israel and all who oppose him, and this will have been his plan all along. This is what was being described in verse 13. The dragon, Satan himself, confined to the earth, no longer free to roam through the heavenlies, and because he knows his time is short, in a terrible rage, he begins to attack anybody who expresses hope in God. And his first target will be the Jewish people. And he will succeed in destroying many of them, but he will not be able to succeed in destroying the 144,000. He pursued the woman, that is Israel, that is 144,000, who gave birth to the male child, Jesus. Because from Israel came Jesus the Messiah. And look at what attempts he makes in verse 15. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Now, we don't know what that river will be, or what it is, you know, is it the breaking of a dam? We don't know what natural kinds of things God will use to bring this about, or maybe it will all be miraculous. But the, 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 the main point is that God will divinely protect them. They are taken somewhere to a desert for the Lord's protection. We don't know where that is. The Bible doesn't tell us where that is. But God will divinely protect the remnant of Jews who he will bring through the great day of God's wrath into the kingdom that is to come. The text says that God opens the earth to swallow, or it says that the earth is open. We presume that God is doing that by a, a great miracle to swallow this amount of water. Now, remember, these are symbolic images of actual events that will take place. There's not going to be a visible dragon or serpent. God is using images to show that Satan will use his power in the last days to attempt to destroy the Jewish remnant, and he will also do many other things as well. Look at verse 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman. Who is the woman? It's the remnant of Israel. He was furious because he can't touch them. So what does he do? And went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And that last sentence there will take us right into the next chapter for next week. And we'll see the astonishing things there. But we've got to talk a little bit about this. Who are the rest of Israel's offspring? Well, that's not a difficult question to answer. They are non-Jews who have been brought into the family of God by Jesus the Messiah, the Redeemer. The rest of the offspring are us. The Gentile believers in Jesus Christ. Remember, God told Abraham close to 2,000 years before Jesus was born that all the nations of the world would be blessed through his seed, his future descendant. That descendant 
was Jesus. And now there are believers all over the world, millions of us, Great, who know and love Jesus, who have been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, Amen. who have been cleansed of all sins and are now yes. waiting for Jesus' return. Yes, Satan will seek through his emissary, the Antichrist, which we'll see in the next chapter, to destroy us as well during that time. Revelation and Matthew show us that some of God's people will be martyred for their faith, mm -hmm. and some will be imprisoned, and some will be persecuted. Now, we are an older generation in here today. We don't know if we will still be alive when these things take place. Excuse me just a minute. I have to, I have to cough. <coughs> but for the generation of Christians that is alive at that time, Jesus says that it will be very rough. Those who love Jesus will be persecuted. Some will lose their lives on account of their faith in him. But from everything I can see in the scriptures about the last days, all of this will happen very, very quickly, within a few short years. Remember that Jesus said, when these things begin to take place, he said to his disciples, lift up your eyes because your redemption draws near. He also said that the generation that begins to see these things unfold, that generation will not pass away until it has all been completed. Now, where again does the rapture fit into all of this? Now, I've explained this in past messages, but we'll deal with it just briefly again and then we'll conclude this morning. I believe with all of my heart from the, I've been studying the scriptures, I've been studying the last events of, of the last days for more than 50 years. I believe that the scripture shows to us that the rapture takes place just prior to the day of God's wrath. I think there has been some confusion on some parts, uh, on the part of some people between the tribulation and the day of God's wrath. Both are great, great tribulation. But there is no evidence in scripture that we will escape some of the tribulation that occurs. Jesus says it very, very clearly. We see it in the epistles. We see it in the book of Revelation. But the Lord will come as a part of his second coming. He will catch us up to meet him in the air as a part of his second coming. Remember I said that the first coming of Jesus had a number of events attached to that first coming. Several things. So also the second coming of Christ involves several events. And the first one I can see is that we will be caught up to meet him in the air because immediately following that, as a part of the return of Christ, in a very short space of time, God begins to rain down <clears throat> on earth what the Bible calls the day of God's wrath. It will be a series of judgments, which we've gone over already from Revelation. It will be a series of judgments for which we will not be present because we do not face the wrath of God. We won't face the wrath of God in eternity, and we won't face the wrath of God upon earth. You see, most of the things that happen during the tribulation period are brought about by people, by mankind, by wars, and even by Satan's work amongst them, and by the raising up of the Antichrist. But when the day of wrath comes, oh, I gotta move to stand in front of you, I'm sorry. 
I still think I have my, <clears throat> my, my uh, little mic on here. But when the day of wrath comes, that is something that God does. He brings it upon the earth. It is judgment. Just like there was a great flood. Just like the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. But in these days, God will bring a series of judgments upon the earth <clears throat> that will literally devastate the earth. It will be like a cleansing of fire. The book of Isaiah tells us that when God is through with the day of wrath, for which we will not be present, there will be few people left upon the earth. If we have eight or nine billion, maybe there will be a couple of billion left. I don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us, but the Bible says that few people will be left. That's how devastating God's destruction will be of this planet because of its sin and wickedness. So we are to remember that the Lord will bring us together to him before all of that takes place. But at the same time, we should understand, now we may not be alive when this comes about, but our, the generations after us will. Maybe it will be our sons and daughters. Maybe it will be our grandchildren. If they are followers of Christ, they will indeed face a very, very tough time. I cannot be true to the scriptures if I do not let God's people know what God is saying. Now God is our overcomer. We win the victory with him. God is with us. God cares for us. If we die for him, we go home to be with him immediately. But all through the book of Revelation and all through the scriptures, especially the New Testament scriptures, we are encouraged to stay strong, to stand strong in Him. So, as we conclude this, these three things again, very quickly, let's not be afraid. Amen. God did not give John the revelation of the last days to make us fearful. Yeah. It is to make us strong and aware and confident. So we don't want to be afraid. The Lord has everything under control. Two, the scriptures continually encourage us to live on <coughs> as faithful witnesses to the gospel. That's you and me. Every day. Every day. Jesus is not just some remote attachment to our lives. Jesus is king. He is Lord. He is God. He created all that exists. We will see him one day. We have now the privilege to know him in a very real, personal, living way. To be assured that our sins are forgiven. And that we have eternal life ahead of him. And so, by the grace of God, we want to live every single day for him. That includes those of us who are retired. We live every day for Jesus Christ. God may have given us the wherewithal to, to, to enjoy retirement and to even to be out here, to be living in the desert and to go out and to, you know, our side-by-sides or whatever, to do all kinds of wonderful, fun things and those may be good. There's nothing wrong with those types of things. But we want to remember that they don't control our lives. Amen. They are not primary for us. Amen. We are God's people. God. We will one day bow before him in great pleasure <coughs> and honor and rejoicing. And we will praise the eternal God who has saved us. And so every day that we have here, we want to live it for the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be faithful to him. We want to be witnesses to the gospel. And then finally, we want to endure. We want to endure. No matter what happens, 
whether it is sickness, disease, impending death, no matter what it is, or for those maybe who come after us, if they encounter the things that we have talked about here, no matter what comes our way, by the grace of God, we will endure. Yes. We will endure. God calls upon us to faithfully endure. And so we pray to him. <clears throat> we ask him, oh Lord God, help me always to be faithful to you. Help me never to be deceived by the things around us in the world that sometimes seem so powerful and so persuasive, but which are not truth. We don't want to be deceived. Let's stand strong in Jesus Christ to the very end. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, your words are strong and powerful and true. Oh God, thank you that you have chosen to give us a great deal of information about the last days. You did so that we might be strong, that our confidence in you would endure, and that we would make it through to that very day when we shall see you face to face. You are the glorious God, almighty. We pray that you would fill our hearts with strength and with peace. Cast out any fear for now or for the future. And help us to daily trust you always. <clears throat> this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.